Well, good morning. When I was 19, uh, there was multiple events in my life that uh, really changed the course of my life. I remember waking up one morning having slept on an ironing board in a motel, and um, I was pretty confused when I woke up. I wasn't sure where I was, how I even got there. What I remember still today is this profound sense of feeling lost. It was shortly after that, just a couple weeks in fact, where as a result of some of my substance abuse issues, I had done some things that were incurring some consequences that would have some unique effects on my life. Some unique effects in the present, but also even in the future. And again, there was that moment where when I was alone, I would just sense this profound lostness. There was insecurity. There was a state of unbelief. There was distrust. I was beginning to see how broken I really was. I had grown up in a great home, two amazing parents, loved the king, Grew up in some really wonderful churches. But at this point in my life at 19, I finally understood that I was spiritually dead. The shame that I was experiencing on a regular basis, not just when I was doing things I knew I shouldn't have been doing, but just the shame and insecurity that I had just going through life. And not having friends that I could count on and call on made it even more difficult. I had a lot of acquaintances. I rubbed shoulders with a ton of different people. I was popular in the the eyes of culture. But I was confused. I was shamed. The guilt was eating me alive. I was spiritually dead. Thankfully, by the grace of God, as I got to a place and recounting kind of where I was at and recognizing just the state that I was living in, there were some men in my life that began to speak some truth to me. I began to read scripture, and what I found is that there was nothing that I could do to pull myself out of this spiritual state of death. But what I did find is that Jesus had been pursuing me this entire time even in the midst of my disobedience, even in the midst of my hand, up in his face saying, I don't want any of that. And he continued to pursue me to the point where I finally released all that I was holding. I was so exhausted. I was exhausted physically, but I was exhausted emotionally because I kept trying to hold so tightly onto the things that I thought would bring pleasure, that I thought would bring purpose, that I thought would bring fulfillment. And I remember that moment when I asked Jesus to be Lord. I wasn't playing games any longer. I wasn't just going to do the right thing. I wasn't just going to try to emulate and impersonate somebody or even try to impersonate Jesus without allowing there to be restoration and transformation that took massive hold in my life so that not that I was going to clean up and then come to Jesus but that I recognized that he would clean me up after I came to Jesus but that's the life of a disciple it may not go in the same type of order that it happened in mine But we all start in a place and in a position of being spiritually dead. We all start in a spiritually dead place. By the grace of God, He rescued me out of that lifestyle. And His grace covered my sin and His righteousness took hold in me so that I could now have a relationship with God the Father. That shame that I had been experiencing and the guilt that I would take on in my life was washed away. Not by my own doing, not by right thinking, not by better habits or more discipline in my life. I was already very disciplined. 
I was just disciplined in the habits of sin. And he began to change my heart forever. That was the beginning of a spiritual journey for me. Recognizing that I was now justified and accepted by God. It's not that I accepted him. We never accept God. We receive something that he has already done for us, but it's that he accepts us. And the beautiful thing is, is he doesn't require us to come clean. He says, just come honestly. And I will change you forever. Last week we began this series called The Loop and we were defining what a disciple was. And I think it's critical for us as we begin to walk through The Loop and we're going to show you what The Loop is. Some of you have emailed me and texted me and said, what's The Loop, bro? You know, you know help us out. And we're going to give you a whole bunch of stuff next week too, and, but we're going to uh, kind of ease you into it. But it was critical for you and for I, uh, uh, for me, to understand what a disciple is as we begin to walk through the loop. And last week, what we said a disciple was is one who's committed to abiding in Jesus, one who's committed to being changed by Jesus, and one who's committed to being on mission for Jesus and with his church. But the loop is that life cycle of a disciple. And in fact, we got a We'll show you a picture of this, and, and it's hard to see here. We're going to give you some things that are going to be right in front of you next week. But the loop is a life cycle of a disciple, recognizing that in that dark place there in that top right corner that we start at a place of being spiritually dead. And then there is, for the disciple, there is a moment when transformation begins. It's not when it just it starts and we're done, but it begins something new. It begins a spirit-led journey. And as we continue in life, we are growing in intimacy, in maturity, in faithfulness, and in sacrifice to the King. That He is constantly transforming us. That none of us have the, a corner on the market as it relates to uh, spiritual matters. You know, we don't have a corner on the market as it relates to being a Christian. But God desires for us to continue to be shaped and molded in His image. And that takes a lifetime. And one day we'll meet Him in a state uh, there in heaven where we become glorified. But up until that point, we're to continue to grow. But it doesn't just stop there. What the loop describes is not just what our growth should look like, but how we walk with others as they continue to grow. Here's the beautiful thing, is that as God is transforming us, He uses us in His transformative work with others as well. That not only is He wanting us to continue to transform into His image, but He allows us the blessing to walk with others as they're being transformed by him as well. Well, I, I love the story today of Zacchaeus. I think Zacchaeus kind of captures uh, not only uh, a similar picture that many of us may relate to and identify with, but we find a man who is desperately seeking after the things of the world and finds hope in the person of Christ. And that's really, that's again, Zacchaeus is that seeker that we talk about who is spiritually dead. He's looking for those things to give him purpose and fulfillment. What Zacchaeus didn't recognize until he got up into that tree is that he would find it in a person. And just to give you some context, though, of Zacchaeus, you know, here's a guy who was at a place in his life where he had all the financial benefits. He had the cultural position of authority in his city. Now, he had gotten that because he was cheating people that he was serving. And as a result of that, he had gained quite a, a, a portfolio, a financial portfolio. And, and he was kind of considered the godfather of the Jericho tax cartel. And I mean, he, uh, he was that guy that people loved when he was given benefits out, but he was the guy that most people hated because of what he stood for. And the truth of the matter, what we see in Scripture is that uh, he was despised. I mean, he was probably about as well-liked by most people as Hitler was by the free world or a, a slumlord is by a tenant. He was hated. He was despised. And um, he was a small man. He was a wee little man, if you remember the song. He wasn't Scottish. He was actually Jewish. And I would imagine that uh, his, uh, 
his stature probably played a role in his insecurity to some degree, and, and maybe his desire to prove himself. Well, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, what we see is a man who comes to a place, a very arrogant man, who comes to a place of incredible humility. I mean, the fact that a guy, the, the godfather of the Jericho tar, uh, cartel, gets up into a tree requires a lot of humiliation. This is a culture that prizes honor and dignity above all things. And Zacchaeus finds himself up a tree. We're going to read the first ten verses. It says this, He entered Jericho, that's Jesus, they're saying. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief or the arch tax collector and he was rich. In fact, that word rich is the word for opulent. I mean, he had incredible wealth. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small of stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and he came down and he received him joyfully. And when they saw it, and, and this is the, the, the crowd around him, when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone into to be a guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and he said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also, or since he is also a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Awesome. I mean, can you imagine, uh, again, just try to picture this. I mean, uh, uh, I don't want to name any names, but if you can think of a really arrogant man with a weird haircut uh, <laughs> that's running for office. I mean, think about a guy like that getting up into a tree. hoping just to see this white-robed vagabond with long hair named Jesus walking by. I mean, you want to talk about some humility. And that's where we find Zacchaeus. I mean, he was hungry for something different in his life. Perhaps like me, he was holding on so tightly to the things that, that culture said you should have. He was financially rich, and yet... Here he is at a place where he's beginning to discover that he's spiritually poor, that he's spiritually bankrupt. And what, one thing that I love about this picture that we have is that it's Jesus who looks at Zacchaeus up in that tree, and he is the one who accepts Zacchaeus. In fact, it's Jesus who invites himself into Zacchaeus' life, not the other way around. But immediately the two of them leave for Zacchaeus' house, and the crowd is just going nuts. It says that they were appalled. They were, they were beside themselves is the literal uh, idiom there. They were beside them. They couldn't believe that this guy Jesus, who says, I am the savior of the world, is going to hang out with such a low life in Zacchaeus. And let's be honest here. I mean, if I'm Jesus, I'm probably doing a double take myself. I hear the crowd going, I can't believe you're hanging out with that sinner. And if I'm honest, I'm probably thinking, I'm not sure I want to be associated with this guy. I'm not sure that I want to take the risk of being despised or being lumped up in the same social identity as Zacchaeus. Jesus didn't blink, though. He just went. And if I'm Zacchaeus, though, for the first time, perhaps, maybe ever, He sees Jesus stand for him even in the midst of a crowd saying, you're a sinner. I mean, can you imagine the shame that Zacchaeus is wearing? I mean, here he is wanting to get a picture of Jesus. I mean, he has already humiliated himself to the point of saying, you know, I want to see this guy. And now he's being ridiculed and shamed publicly. And if I'm Zacchaeus and I see Jesus standing alongside me, I am already sensing 
that I feel valued and loved and cared for. Probably something very unique for Zacchaeus at that point in his life. But we don't know all the details of the conversation that Zacchaeus and Jesus had, but what we do know are the responses by both of them. We know that Zacchaeus got out of a tree and walked into a conversation with Jesus and he was transformed and changed forever. We know that his, his behavior changed following a recognition of who Jesus was now in his life. And so as we, we put this in context of the loop, as we put this in context of the life cycle of a disciple, I, I want to look at both lives in this story for a moment. I want to look at Zacchaeus, the life of a seeker, one who was longing to find pleasure and fulfillment and purpose in so many different things, and what he came to find out, that all those things were met in Jesus. And take a look at Zacchaeus' response, and then we're going to come back and we're going to look at Jesus' response to Zacchaeus, because just as each one of us begins a life that is spiritually bankrupt. Once we become a disciple of Jesus, he longs for us to emulate him, invest in others, engage others, just like he did with Zacchaeus. Well, look at Zacchaeus' response to Jesus. The first thing we see is this, is that Zacchaeus recognizes that Jesus alone gives purpose and fulfillment as Lord of our life. That he alone gives purpose and fulfillment as Lord of our life. Now we know that Zacchaeus had been living in a state of disbelief, unbelief, insecurity, distrust. We, we know that he was looking for purpose and meaning from the things that he would acquire or maybe the mountains that he would, he would climb, that he had very little trust in other people. He was very insecure. I mean, we, we saw that just in the way that he treated people. I mean, he was stealing from, I don't know if they were honest or not, but he was stealing nonetheless. Taking things that he didn't really need. He was just filling his pocket, but he was also filling his mind and his heart for the measures of cultural success, power, prestige, position, privilege. But what he found out quickly in that conversation is that Jesus fulfills all of those desires in our heart. He fulfills them differently. He fills them economically. Not in the sense of financial good, but in the sense of he accomplishes a lot of things at one time. But what he found was when he made Jesus Lord of his life, that desire for power, Jesus said, I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit so that you can accomplish my purpose. His desire for privilege I mean, what greater privilege could a child of God have than to call on the Father and access the King? In terms of prestige, I mean, who wouldn't want to be a part of the royal family, right? In terms of position, Scripture says in Ephesians 2, 5, says, by grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us up, seated us up with Christ Jesus he now is at the same table. What he found is that Jesus was coming to give him life and to give him life more abundantly. And we know that Zacchaeus was expressing lordship here not only because he addresses Jesus as Lord, but because his behavior authenticates that. That no longer was he putting himself in a position of being the head, but he was now coming in submission to Jesus. And he says to Jesus, Lord, half of my goods I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. No longer was he going to take the position of being the boss, rather he was going to allow Jesus to be the boss and the master. What a beautiful thing. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, then you will be saved. We know that Zacchaeus 
made Jesus Lord that day. And what Jesus said is today, salvation has come to this house. Second thing we see in, in Zacchaeus' response to Jesus is that he recognized that Jesus alone brings forgiveness of sin. Jesus alone brings forgiveness of sin. I mean, Zacchaeus thought prosperity and influence could cover the shame and the emptiness that he was hiding. And, and I mean, it is kind of funny how we, we kind of do the same thing. We, uh, we try to cosmetically cover up some of the sin or shame or guilt that we have in life. And as we continue to try to do that, it just increases the gap of brokenness in our relationship with God and in our relationship with other people. And yet we still try to justify that sin. We try to justify that sin because we want to get rid of the shame. We want to get rid of that sense of guilt that we have. But we hate being wrong in what we're doing. And so we're going to go find somebody, seek acceptance and affirmation so that our behavior is justified. And you know what? It's easy to find that. What we don't always want to recognize is that Jesus is the plumb line. Not only does he define what is right and what is wrong, but he also forgives when we fall short of that. And what Zacchaeus found out, that his sin could not be forgiven or even justified apart from the life of Christ. Uh, he couldn't pay Jesus off. I mean, he was opulently rich. He probably could have written a check. There wasn't a minimum requirement that he could do to pay for this. He was spiritually bankrupt. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Zacchaeus understood in that moment that it was Jesus who tithed his life and his blood to save him. I love what 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. You see, if Jesus had stayed in, in, in heaven in a rich state, Rather than coming to us in a poor state, we would, content, we would still be spiritually bankrupt. But he came from the opulence of heaven to the brokenness of earth so that he would save us. And once Zacchaeus understood that and understood that his life was born out of grace rather than law, not only did he want to fulfill that, but he wanted to even go beyond that. He wanted to live beyond the measure that was given. Romans 5, 8 says this, but God shows his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Third thing we see from Zacchaeus, his response. This is a mouthful, but this is important. You're going to want to write this down. Salvation does not come in response to a changed life, but a changed life comes in response to salvation. Let me say that again. Salvation does not come in response to a changed life. But a changed life comes in response to salvation. You know, for years and years, I wrestled with that. I mean, I had grown up in the church. I had seen what, what good behavior looked like, and I was hanging my hat on good behavior, right? Which God really doesn't, he, he doesn't care about that like we think he cares about that. I kept thinking to myself, if I will just deal with my sin, if I will just take care of my shame, if I will just have the discipline to stop doing these things, then I will be accepted. And the reality is, is I can't be accepted as a result of a behavioral change. Rather, he accepts me because of his grace, out of his character and out of his personhood. And my life begins to change once I submit myself to him. And Zacchaeus found the same to be true. It starts with a transfer of assets. And, and for Zacchaeus, a money guy, he began to recognize that this wasn't about moving money around, but it was about allowing Jesus to replace his sinfulness with Jesus' righteousness. I love what 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says. It says, for if anyone is in Christ, the old self is gone and the new has come. 
And once we, like Zacchaeus, allow Jesus to be the Lord of, and Savior of our life, our hearts begin to change and begin to transform into His. I think it's probably tragically true that even the church today continues to live in a place and many in the church continue to live in a place where they go back to a point in their life and they say, you know, I, I accepted Jesus. I mean, you know, I, I did the little sinner's prayer and, you know, took care of that a long time ago. And I, I just want to maybe real quickly flash a neon sign that says, be careful. The church today continues to live in a depraved state because I believe most haven't made Jesus Lord. And this is not an indictment on you. I don't, I don't know your state. I don't know your spiritual state. But what I do know is Scripture is very clear that apart from making Jesus Lord, we will not be saved. Apart from recognizing that only by the grace of Jesus can we receive forgiveness. Again, not something that we do, but what he has done for us. My prayer as we continue in this series, my prayer today is that if there are those of us who are wrestling right now with that, that we'd be willing to be honest with the king. I'm not trying to get you to question something that maybe you know for certain that you've done. But what I do want to make sure of is that you recognize that only Jesus alone accepts us. That by his forgiveness alone does he deal with our spiritual state of depravity. And only when we submit ourselves to him fully and wholly, that doesn't mean that perfection comes following after that. That's why he's constantly transforming us. But that we recognize that no longer are we going to grab hold of that wheel, even though we may try to take hold of it every once in a while, but we recognize that he and he alone is the driver. Well, look at Jesus' response to Zacchaeus. which ought to be similar in our response in pursuing people. And, and I, boy, I love this. The first thing that we see with Jesus is that he practices the presence of people. That he practices the presence of people. We can't sa- separate the practice of the presence of God apart from the practice of the presence of people. In fact, when we look at Matthew 22, 37 through uh, 40, it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and spirit, and your neighbor as yourself. Now, we typically like to separate those things, but the scripture doesn't separate those, neither does God. That we must recognize that we are in relationship with God and we are in relationship with his creation. But Jesus delighted in people. We see that here with Zacchaeus. We see this throughout the New Testament as Jesus walked along and met with folks. He delights in people. Now, the church leaders of of Jesus' day They were diligent, they were passionate, they were committed. They would memorize entire books of the Bible. They would give their finances in order to meet a minimum requirement. They would pray, they would give to the poor. They would even talk about God. But they didn't find pleasure in the midst of people. They never linked loving God with the need to grow and their ability to love people. And as a result of this, they would criticize Jesus too. Why are you hanging out with that low life, Zacchaeus? Even his disciples who'd been hanging with Jesus for a while when he was with the woman at the well and they find out that he, he was with this uh, uh, potential prostitute, they're going, Jesus, what, what were you doing? You know, you shouldn't have been there. Culturally, it's not cool. But, you know, and they had every excuse to give Jesus, but Jesus delighted in people. He loved the presence of, of people. I mean, that's the essence of the gospel, that what Jesus has done for us in our broken, painful, and even lethargic state, not what we do 
for him. But we love the presence of people. We should love the presence of people just like Jesus did. Now, I know for some of us, we, we don't like this. I mean, I, I, well, I don't remember because it was a long time ago and I don't think any of you remember, but you, you understand Copernicum theory, right? I'm sure you all get that. So Copernicus was the guy who discovered that uh, uh, the earth doesn't, or, or the sun doesn't revolve around us. Now, some of us still think that, right? I mean, and, and when he came out with this theory and we recognized that we actually revolve around the sun, I mean, this was earth-shattering for people. You mean there's something bigger than what's going on in my life? Yeah. You know, and I think for some of us, we need one of those uh, Co Copernicum uh, revolutions to take place in our own life. Where we recognize that God not only is transforming us, but he longs for us to be in the presence of people so that we can participate in that process as he transforms others. And these people were appalled by Jesus' response to be in the presence of such a pariah in Zacchaeus. But Jesus' love for Zacchaeus trumped their response. The, the scriptural notion, love your neighbor as yourself, wasn't just some principle that Jesus would say because... It sounded good, but he lived it out. He modeled it because he took delight in the presence of people. I believe Zacchaeus recognized that Jesus delighted in him. And as a result, he gave ear to what Jesus had to say. How true that is today in our relationships. Second thing is this. Jesus didn't let his assumptions sabotage his purpose. Well, this happens all the time for us. Don't let your assumptions sabotage your purpose. I mean, I make up my mind about people all the time. I hate to admit that. My past pain, my experience, my background, my education... You know, paint a picture for me sometimes. I know that that's the same for you. And listen, I think those things are good to consider. I think it gives perspective. I think uh, sometimes that can be very helpful. But I will also say that when we begin to make assumptions, it can also inhibit our ability to love people. It inhibits our ability. Our assumptions can often leave us with immense pain and brokenness and even more ignorance. I mean, case in point, if I make an assumption about someone without the confirmation that what they did was true, I essentially believe a lie about that person. This is a distortion of reality. It's even possible that I'm believing something that is altogether untrue. It's also likely that I'll probably pass on that assumption that is untrue to other people. And essentially, I'm creating this counterfeit world. A counterfeit world that maybe I feel a little bit more at peace in living in because it protects me and keeps me from having to engage somebody that I'm fearful of. But you need to understand that when we do that, we create division. We, we create confusion. We create divergence. I mean, do we assume that people don't want to hear about the hope and the peace and the redemption that Jesus brings? Do we look at people as Jesus looks at them? Or do we do one of those up-downs? I was visiting a guy the other day, and I, I, I think I looked kind of like this. I had jeans and a, a shirt on, and said, hey, how you doing? I'm Eric Herstrom, and uh, pastor over at LABC, and he does one of these little up, down, you know. <laughs> You're the pastor? I felt about that small. Now I'm a big boy. I'll be, I'm fine. I got over that real, real fast. I actually laughed about it the rest of the week. But how often do we make assumptions? And by doing that, I think we assume people to hell. Hell. 
third and last thing when we look at Jesus' response is that he was as much about the conversation as he was about the conversion. And my encouragement to you is to count conversations more than conversions. Count the conversations that you have with people more than the conversions. By the way, it's not your job to convert somebody anyways. That's the Holy Spirit's job. And he, man, he is great at that. And uh, business is good. But it is our responsibility to engage people in conversations. I mean, it is clear that Jesus came. In fact, he says this in, in verse 10. It's clear that he came to seek and save the lost. It's also clear that his method was very relational. We don't see Jesus with a bullhorn and a sandwich board going around saying, repent or die, do we? Thank goodness we don't. He was direct. He was clear. But he was also gentle to those who chose to listen. Listen. And he didn't just leave people with the information about here's what you got to do on the day of the Lord. But he engaged them. Even if it was for a moment, he established a relationship and rapport with them. Gave them opportunity. We also know that Jesus had very, very little tolerance for those who distorted the word of God and walked around with a puffed up chest. Rather, he was interpersonal. He was interactive with the hurting and with the humble. It's easy for us to share the message of Christ without compassion and even patience. And wipe our hands of that and say, you know, I've done my duty. I've pursued people. I've glorified God and pursued people. Easy for us to do that. Much more difficult for us to engage people, we lay our assumptions aside and we engage people, delight in them, establish rapport with them, listen to them. I mean, it would be a misinterpretation of our, of our purpose if we began to treat people like projects. And if we're counting the conversions, I would bet we're also probably treating people like projects rather than engaging them, listening. When, when you go to the doctor, uh, this is one of my least favorite parts of going to the doctor, is when they do open nerve questioning. So if you've got a pain somewhere, or, or maybe it's just open nerve uh, questioning as it relates to something you're just feeling, and they kind of poke around at your body, you know, does it hurt here? No. Does it hurt here? No. Just, oh! You know, and they do that. That's what's called open nerve questioning. And the point of doctors doing that, I mean, it's a great practice because the point of them doing that is to find out where's the pain. And as followers of Jesus, we ought to do a lot of that open nerve question, a lot of that open nerve listening. Here's what I can guarantee you that is true about every single one of us in this room and that is true of every single person outside of this room is that there are at least four things that each one of us will experience in our lifetime that create pain. And if we will just listen to those things, we'll have the opportunity to bring conversation about Jesus into the mix. You don't have to have a bullhorn. You don't have to have a sandwich board. But there's four things that we all experience. One is crisis. I mean, you may be thinking to yourself, well, I really haven't had much crisis in my life. You just haven't lived long enough. You will experience crisis in your life. Stress. Every single person experiences stress. Uh, loss, or maybe loss of a job, that may be death. Change. I can guarantee you, though, what is true for us, and when we're open nerve questioned, is true for everybody else. And here's the beautiful thing, is that God will use those opportunities when we just sit down and have a conversation with folks to allow us to express his gospel. I remember uh, a really nice guy that I was uh, uh, playing basketball with for quite a while, and um, he, he had a special name for me as a pastor, and, and uh, initially I was kind of offended, and, and, 
but he kept calling uh, me this special name, and so I just decided to enjoy it. And um, it, it was a cuss word following pastor. And uh, what I found is it really was a term of endearment for me uh, in a weird sort of way from his perspective and his world. But we would play a couple times a week together, and I remember one, uh, one morning after we were done playing, he, he, uh, he kind of rushed out of there as I was leaving, and he put his arm around me and said, hey, man, I really need to talk. My, things are, I mean, just crashing in my marriage. And uh, absolutely, what does that look like? So that afternoon, we, we met at his restaurant. We began some conversation. I remember about two weeks later, I had hired him to do something at our house, and he came and he brought the stuff, and then without invitation by Laura and I, he just walked in and he just plopped down on the couch. And so I plopped down on the couch next to him, and he just began to open up his heart, express his pain. And right there on the couch, without an invitation from me or even an assumption at that point, I was able to share the good news. Listen, people are hungry for this. They don't know what to do with their pain and hurt. They will continue to cosmetically deal with it until they either die or they recognize that Jesus is the hope of the world. And as God is transforming you and me, he also longs to use us in his transformative process with others as we pursue people like he's pursued us. Who's that person? that you could begin some of that open nerve questioning or open nerve listening to? Who's that person in your home? Who's that person in your workplace? Who's that person at your school? It may take some time. I knew this guy for about a year and a half before that conversation ensued. But boy, was it worth it when God had prepared him for that moment. Pray with me. Father, thank you for taking us who are disciples from a place of being spiritually dead to being made alive in you. Thank you for cleaning us up by your righteousness, not by our willpower. Thank you for taking our shame and putting it where it's supposed to be and replacing it with your grace and your mercy. Father, would you help us now just to be honest with you? We'd be honest about our position with you We'd be honest about our relationship with others. Father, I'm just thankful that uh, wherever we are today, wherever you find us, you accept us. You take our burdens off of us. Father, would you allow, would you help us allow you to work in these few moments? In Jesus' name, amen.